Welcome to UO Today. I'm Paul Pepys, Interim Director of the Oregon Humanities Center. Our guest today is Robert K. Elder, Editor-in-Chief of Chicago Sun-Times Media Local, overseeing 36 suburban Chicago publications. Elder is an alumnus of the School of Journalism and Communication. Pulitzer winner Studs Terkel called Elder a journalist in the noblest tradition in his foreword to Elder's book, Last Words of the Executed. Elder has written a number of other books, including John Wu Interviews, and the film that changed my life, 30 Directors on Their Epiphanies in the Dark. Elder's latest book, The Best Film You've Never Seen, is a compilation of interviews with 35 directors who champion their favorite overlooked or critically panned movies. Elder presented a talk back after the screening of the classic film, A Man for All Seasons, at the Bijou Art Cinemas on October 17, 2013, as a guest of the UO Cinema Studies Program and School of Journalism and Communication. Rob, thanks for coming on the show. Paul, thanks for having me. Tell us how you decided to attend the University of Oregon as an undergraduate. Um, it was a couple of things. Uh, one was uh, that you had a very uh, interesting international program. Uh, but one of the primary movers in this was when I was in Billings, Montana at age 17. Uh, Ken Kesey was on book tour and I interviewed him for my high school newspaper. And uh, he gave me a piece of advice which I have followed ever since. It served me well, which is like if you want to be a journalist, um, start now. Don't wait for anybody's permission. Um, and uh, you know you may not be doing what you thought you'd be doing, but you'll be happy because you'll be so far have a, ahead of everybody else um, that uh, you know it won't matter. And so that sort of message of building experience and velocity um, really resonated with me. And he sort of, as we became friends, he said, "Well, come out to the University of Oregon. I'm teaching a class out here." And of course, I came out here, and he never taught a class again. <laughs> so, so, uh, but I did become his his archivist. I um, uh, I annotated his uh, correspondence uh, at the Knight Library, where we are now. Yeah. So, tell me, uh, tell me a little bit more about that part of your relationship with him. How'd you, how'd you, how did you convince him to let you do that archiving job? And and I don't think I needed to convince him. I think we had a rapport, and it needed to be done. Uh, mm -hmm. He and Ken Babs, who is his friend and right hand man, uh, had just dumped all of this stuff on the university, and it was in disarray. So I helped give it order. Um, you know, it was not completely altruistic. I got credit for it, um, but it has made me an archives geek. Forever. So whenever I'm in a university town, I was in Austin a little while ago. I visited the Harry Ransom uh, uh, Center. Um, my own uh, papers are, are at uh, Indiana University, so um, I'm in good company there with uh, Kurt Vonnegut <laughs> and Orson Welles. So um, uh, yeah, it had a profound impact. And have you been over there s on your visit here? Have you been to the special collection since you've been here? I was there this morning uh -huh. with Babs, uh -huh. actually. Uh, and we were going over the work and uh, talking about what the future might hold. You know, of course, that we have now finally secured the papers yep. forever. So yep. this is a great, great thing for us. Yeah. Obviously, it's what Ken wanted. And yeah. So, um, I'm going to switch gears a little bit. Tell us what inspired you to write uh, your book, Last Words of the Executed, about the final words of executed prisoners. Primarily it was because that there was no modern examination. Um, the book is not a political book. It simply asks um, if these are the most reviled outcast members of society, why does it remain a cultural value to record what they say? Mm -hmm. And more importantly than that, um, what can we learn from it? Mm -hmm. you know? So it became this fascinating exploration that um, you know, took years. Uh, Studs Terkel wrote me a lovely introduction and was very supportive. Um, but it was a hard project to do, but it's had the, the most legs. Um, and, uh, you know, it, you know, I spent four or five years on it, maybe more. Um, and it also made me realize I never want to write about the death penalty again. Ah, interesting. <laughs> so did you learn anything especially surprising or uh, enlightening during the process? Well, that was one of them. I mean, it's yeah, very it's hard. <laughs> I mean, my, my wife, who is very much my co-collaborator, and I could not do any of this without her, um, and, and that is not hyperbolic, it's true. Um, you know, she was pregnant with our twins while we were um, doing that book, and we were in separate offices, you know, trying to get the editing done because I'm, I'm more than a little dyslexic, so she helps me straighten that out. And, um, you know, at one point she is very pregnant in a rolly chair, and she's yelling at me, she's like, do we have Dahmer? <laughs> and, then, and then I have to yell back, um, Dahmer died in prison, he has no last words. Huh. And those are not the kind of conversations you want to have when you're 
bringing two new lives <laughs> into the world. So I told her, like, after this book, it's, it's all going to be, you know, uh, frivolous books about love and sex and movies. So. Um, did writing the book influence your views on the death penalty or incarceration? Um, uh, I have, since it's not what the book is about, I kind of didn't address it. Um, and I have had people on both sides of the issue be mad at me for different reasons. Mm. One of them was the, the right didn't want me to write it at all. Um, and uh, Because you would humanize these criminals? Partly. Uh -huh. um, and folks on the left were mad that I pointed out that, for example, you know, there was research that came out later that Sokol and Vanzetti probably be guilty. Mm -hmm. So that enraged mm -hmm. a, whole other, a whole other thing. So um, I think it is more valuable to me to uh, present the last words and have those people tell their story rather than have an agenda because then mm -hmm. it's not a useful book. I see. So among your very many numerous projects is Odd Hours Media. Sure. Um, tell us what that is and tell us why you launched that company. Sure. So Odd Hours Media is sort of my multimedia company. Um, and uh, after I told my wife, you know, no more, no more books about death, only about sex and love and frivolity, <laughs> um, I started these two websites. Um, uh, one was called It Was Over When, Tales of Romantic Dead Ends. And what they were, they were little sort of snapshots, little vignettes about the moment you knew your relationship was doomed. Not when it was over, but you knew like it just was not going to work. And the, uh, the story I would tell, because this started as a party game, because I used to be really bad at parties. So the way I would draw people in and, and get them talking was, you know, tell me the story. And the story I would tell was I was um, bundled up with a, a woman I had just started dating, and we were in a blanket together watching TV. And I watched in horror as she took her chocolatey hand, which she had been eating, you know, a chocolate bar with, and just wiped it on the blanket. And then like folded it over, <laughs> and I thought like eh, it's probably not going to work out. <laughs> so I did that. I did that, um, and I put that website up, and it went viral quickly while we were in beta testing. Mm. I was at my kid's pediatrician, and I had a national radio station calling me. So uh, um, and then I launched its sister website. It was Love Win, uh, which is much sweeter. Um, very soon after that, and it just became a way for me to do crowdsourcing and multimedia projects. Um, now I'm doing TV production, hmm. um, so it's online. Uh, no, no, I'm uh, partnering with uh, huh. like Towers Productions, and uh, I've had a couple of options. So um, oh. until I have something actually produced, uh, I don't like to sell my call myself a producer, but uh -huh. that's what I'm doing. So that's the track I'm uh, using to explore with that company. Can you share with us what these? No. No, <laughs> yeah, no problem. I, I, I can tell you that some of them are, are based on my work, uh, and then some of them are based on original ideas. Um, and I was in, uh, was in book tour, I was on book tour in LA recently, um, and it's really interesting. You never know where your career is going to take you, but um, you know, I can tell you that I was on the Sony lot in the Lucille Ball building. <laughs> And I was like, oh, this is awesome, <laughs> you know? And it's just nice talk. Until something happened, it's nice talk, but it's still nice talk. So. <laughs> um, do you have any idea why uh, those, uh, uh, it was over when .com and it was love when, why they went viral so quickly? Wha why are people so fascinated by this I think because you laughed. I think that's, yeah. I think, you know, um, we all have similar uh, romantic experiences. It's, you know, having your heart broken is a, a unified uh, experience that we all have. And uh, I think we all have more stories of defeat and heartbreak than we have of successes. In fact, that's how it should be. Mm -hmm. um, and I think what I created was uh, a forum for people to commiserate and to share and to laugh. And I, I hope it was healing. <laughs> I was looking at them last night. I, um, we didn't explain you. So the, the 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 person tells the story, and then there's a second part which is aftermath. Yeah, <laughs> right. Which tells you when they actually broke up. Or sometimes it's the punchline. Uh, a friend of mine uh, uh, wrote this. Uh, so her story was, um, I asked my boyfriend what his uh, favorite sexual fantasy was, and he said, two redheads. <laughs> I'm a brunette. <laughs> <laughs> and then the, the aftermath is, he left me two months later for a blonde. Ah, uh, good one. Oh, that's a good story. So another one of your areas of interest is film. Mm -hmm. what, what led to your interest in film? It's my primary interest. Uh, it's my first love. Um, I was a film critic for the Chicago Tribune for five years. Um, I have since uh, failed upward into management. Um, but uh, I love movies and I love sharing uh, you know, films with people and I love having conversations with directors in particular. Um, 
and uh, yeah, it's just one of the things that uh, um, I drive the most joy from. So tell us uh, who John Wu is and why you decided to, to do a book of interviews with him. Sure. So John Wu is the director from Hong Kong who is best known in Hong Kong for Hard Boiled and The Killer. Um, he did what are called these bullet ballets, you know, highly choreographed, hyper violent films. Um, and uh, the uh, he's best known in the U.S. for Face Off and Mission Impossible 2 and Broken Arrow. Um, and I did a book with him simply because I was asked. Uh, University of Mississippi Press approached me and said, hey, we saw this profile you did in the Chicago Tribune. Would you be interested in spending more time with John? And, and it, it was a very ambitious book because it was supposed to be a collection in of interviews, but what I tried to do was tell the first sort of authoritative English language version of his life. Mm -hmm. And John initially did not want to because so much had been mistranslated. But uh, I'm very proud of that first book. Huh, that's a good story. So to say that you're an experienced interviewer would be an understatement. You've interviewed, uh, you just told me, over 100 film directors, authors including Ken Kesey and Don DeLillo, as, m as well as many others. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us about a particularly memorable or significant interview that you've done? Um, I mean, it's, it's hard because I do so many of them. Mm -hmm. um, but one that was interesting, just for the time, is um, I had an interview scheduled with Charlton Heston and his wife hmm. on September 11th. Oh, wow. And uh, it, so it was a little weird, and I ended up, be just because of the timing, I ended up at his hotel, and we decided, like, you know what, it's, let's just postpone it. So I think we maybe did it the next day after I scrambled and we covered the news of the day. And um, it was an interesting interview because it was not only about the time we were in now but he you know he had been a, a pilot in world war ii mm -hmm. and he sort of gave me some historical perspective about you know we've had this before pearl harbor you know this is how the nation reacts he was also mad um at the uh, clinton administration who had revoked his um security clearance so uh you know he was getting back the security clearance he had lost under the previous previous administration um but also uh it was a wonderful interview because it was him and, and his wife, Lydia Clark Heston, and um, he has told the same stories for like 50 years, you know, this, these great Orson Welles stories, you know, that he sort of doles out as like rewards. Mm -hmm. um, and so I asked him, I asked her basically, I was like, what is your favorite story? You know, you have to listen to these a lot. What's your favorite story from Chuck? What reveals most about him? And um, they were performing Love Letters, which is this, you know, famous play. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, um, and I just said, you know, as sort of as a follow-up, I was like, well, Chuck, how, how has Lydia changed since you, you know, started writing her love letters when you were in the Air Force? And he just said, she looks the same as she did then. <laughs> and kind of like was weepy, and I, because I'm, I'm a girl, I, w <laughs> I sort of welled up as well. <laughs> wow, Carlton Heston weepy, wow, that's yeah. quite a thought. Um, how did you select the directors that you interviewed uh, for your latest book, The Best Film You've Never Seen? Um, it was two things. Um, it was people who had a point of view, and a powerful point of view. Um, people who were good at being interviewed. Because there are some people, directors, who they're, like, they're very visual and a conversation is not their medium. Um, the other very important um, criteria is that they said yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> Tell us a little bit about the films that are on that list. So uh, for the best film you've never seen or the mm -hmm. film that changed yeah, my life? The, the best film you've never seen. So for the best film you've never seen, uh, my challenge to them was basically help me rewrite film history. So there are a lot of films out there that were lost for some reason or did not have critical acclaim or the critics just went after it. They mm -hmm. savaged these films. So why were they wrong? Tell me about a, a film that is close to your heart and let's help bring it a new audience. So uh, Guillermo del Toro told me about this Mexican horror film called The Arcane Sorcerer. Um, Danny Boyle talked about Eureka, mm -hmm. which is this sort of uh, little known Nicholas Rogue film. Um, and then like Edgar Wright talked about this 1970s uh, film, uh, the, the Super Cops, which informed um, Hot Fuzz, which is mm. one of his films. So I was bringing these uh, sometimes obscure films into a public light. And then sometimes, like for example, uh, we showed uh, A Man for All Seasons last night at the Bijou, and uh, Kevin Smith picked that, and he basically said, like, listen, it belongs, um, it's a powerful film, but I, and I are, you know, part of my job is to be devil's advocate with these interviewees, or with these directors. And um, 
I said, listen, it swept the Oscars in 1966. It probably, I, like, it doesn't belong in the book, but he sort of stuck to his guns and say, said, listen, the fact that it swept the Oscars and no one talked about it anymore. Mm-hmm. No one knows who Paul Schofield is, who won Best Actor. Um, no one knows who's in the film. Um, and no one under 30 has seen it. So it deserves to be in there. And the more I do press for the book and the more I have conversations with people and the more I show the, people, the, the film to people, um, he's right. <laughs> uh, and in fact, one of the programmers admitted to me, he's like, you know what, I've never seen it. Uh, so, uh, well, I, w- yeah. I was going to say, I've seen it, but then I'm over 30. <laughs> so, um, how did, it, how did, what was the reception like last night? For it was great. It was great. And people were very talkative. And um, uh, my professor, Tom Wheeler, reminded me, and I forgot that Orson Welles is in it. I thought, like, huh. oh, no one's in it, but he's in it for about. Who does he play? I can't he remember. He plays Wolsey, Cardinal Wolsey. Huh, interesting. He, and he's in it for about. You know, three minutes. And Robert Shaw plays him. Robert Shaw, uh, you know, Quint from Jaws, <laughs> yeah, shows yeah, up to really chew the scenery. <laughs> he shows up and just devours an entire scene. <laughs> um, what for you? What's the best film you've ne- uh, that, y- uh, that you for that's yours for that list? Um, I have a couple. One mm-hmm. of them is selfish, and one of them is selfishly local. Mm-hmm. Uh, it is uh, Without Limits, um, and uh, it's uh, the Robert Town film. Mm-hmm. And part of the reason it is a great film. You know, Robert Town did. Uh, you know, Chinatown and Tequila Sunrise and a lot of great scripts. Um, I worked for him. I was a PA um, while he shot in Eugene. Mm-hmm. Um, I uh, met my high, my I met my college girlfriend on the set. Um, so, so this uh, is when you were an undergrad here. Yeah, when I was an uh, undergrad. So, uh. so I, I uh, not only got a movie experience, but I also fell in love. So it's uh, very dear to my heart. But if you if you check the um, uh, if you watch the movie, you can see me in a, in a few of the scenes as an extra in awful '70s clothes. <laughs> so, it, but it's just a great movie. Billy Crudup is great. Donald Sutherland is great. Um, the other film that I always tell people about is also a Donald Sutherland film, uh, Panic. Uh, huh. It came out I think in 2001. Uh, he and William H Macy as two generations of hitmen. Uh, so, put those in your Netflix queue. Okay. Um, how does it feel to be back in Eugene? When was the last time you were here? Um, I think three years ago. Um, I gave the commencement address for uh, the journalism school. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, again, I love Eugene. Um, it reminds me of being, you know, young and a hungry academic. And uh, I, uh, I just realized no place smells like Eugene. <laughs> quite, quite literally. It's that wonderful sort of, I, I can't quite put... <coughs> Excuse me, I can't quite put my finger on it, but that, you know, it smells like the color green. Um, the fact that, you know, it's foggy in the morning, and somebody told me, it's like, uh, you know, it's more romantic when you know that uh, fog is just a cloud on the ground, <laughs> you know. So I have very romantic uh, memories and notions about Eugene, so all of that came flooding back. And I got to see, you know, I got to go to the Bijou Theater, which is where I saw things like Pulp Fiction. And Drunken Master 2, which is if you haven't seen, you need to. Uh, and Clerks, and I had a date go really, really wrong at the Bijou. So you know, it lets me sort of live vicariously through the person that I was. Um, <laughs> I love Eugene. So let me ask you about the other uh, film book, uh, the film that changed my life: Thirty Directors on Their Epiphanies in the Dark. Um, w- out of that book, what's the the interview that you did there the that was the most memorable for you? Um, or again, you know, there, are, there are a lot of them, but I, I enjoy talking to Michelle Gondry, who did one of my favorite films, uh, Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless mm-hmm, Mind, mm-hmm. It's a masterpiece. Mm-hmm. Um, and he talked about this film called uh, En Voyage Le Ballon, mm. uh, The Voyage of the Balloon. And it's sort of a sequel to The Red Balloon, but it's a you know, feature length. And not only was he just interesting to talk to, um, but in these interviews, in many of these interviews, what's interesting is you end up learning more about the director than you do about the film. Mm-hmm. So mm. I, I talked to him, and mm. w- I've had a couple of directors actually tell me like how they want to die. Mm. You know, so Michelle talked about uh, because the director of that film died, I think, uh, outside Tehran in a helicopter accident mm. while while shooting. And I mm. said, "Well, did, do you want to die shooting a film? Like, how do you want to go?" And Michelle is great, and he su- has this such lo- this lust for life. He's like, he's like, I want the last drop of life possible, and if that's on a movie set, yes. But I want the last 
drop of life possible. So I've always remembered that. So you said a couple of them told you. Yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah. tell me the other one. Alex Proyas, um, who directed The Crow and iRobot and Dark City, um, uh, also wants to die behind the camera. Wants to die you know? behind the camera. Huh. But, but you find out weird things about people's biography. Um, there are two Gana Canadian directors in that book, and the films that changed their lives uh -huh. um, were films that they happened across while they were uh, surfing uh, foreign channels in, on the Canadian broadcast system, oh. looking for skin. Oh. They were looking for nudity. And so example, for example, Adam McGoyan uh, comes across Persona, huh. which is a very sort of like sexually charged film with yep. no sex. No sex um, yeah. But, you know, literally, so his, his, you know, teenage hormones led him to a film that changed the course of his life. Huh. That's a great story. So, um, what other, what, what, t tell us what you're working on now. You mentioned the, the production. Is there s uh, other, th other projects that you're working on at this point? Uh, yeah, I mean, um, I'm not under book contract, so I'm sort of loving that. And uh, I was recently promoted, so uh, more than all of my energy is uh, devoted to the Sun-Times Media Local and those 36 publications. But I'm, I'm trying to formulate what the next book is. Um, and I think I have a question, um, but I'm trying to formulate it. And since uh, my last sort of serious non-pop culture book was about death, um, the next natural subject is sex. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> yes. Well, not only that, but I have I have a very sort of academic question about that. So my many of my books, uh, from the death penalty book to the um, movie books and even the relationship books, I have sort of become a chronicler of epiphanies. Mm -hmm. You know, when did mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. X or, you know, what struck you? And, mm -hmm. and um, what I'm interested in is what influences the practice and sort of shape of desire? How does that change over your lifetime? Mm -hmm. So, um, for example, is it um, not just a new partner, but is it culture? So how does your sexual desire and practice change when uh, you live through the AIDS epidemic? Mm -hmm. Or Fifty Shades of Grey is a national mm -hmm. bestseller. Mm -hmm. Or um, Will and Grace uh, is a cultural phenomenon for seven or eight years. Mm -hmm. So I'm interested in that core question. Um, and I'm, I've done some interviews already. I don't know what the shape of it is going to be. But um, that's where I'm. That's where my curiosity is, is so leading. You know, uh, just any old people you would interview, or no, no. I think what I want to do is be more systematic about it. But th so I, I have this idea of taking people from age 12 to 92, and I don't want to take people's sort of sexual histories. I'll you're not. You're, you're not. You're not doing the 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 apted thing of you. You're just. You're going to interview a 12 year old and a 17 year old and a 20 year old. I think 12 and 22 and 32 and, it, and all the way up, but men mm -hmm. and women. Um, but there are two problems with that. One is there is so much variation even within a gender. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I was talking with some people at the Kinsey Institute about this, mm -hmm. and one of the researchers said, like, listen, uh, men are as, within a, within a group, men are as different from one another as they are from women. Mm -hmm. So you have that variation, you have cultural variation. Mm -hmm. The other thing that I hope I am wrong on, that I, you know, I'm, I'm trying to figure out is, um, I think men as a gender tend to whatever um, turns us on is established so early and is dug so deep, I'm not sure what the arc of change is. Mm -hmm. So I kind of like that I don't know mm -hmm. the answer because it'll make it a more interesting project, but I also don't know if it's the next project because, you know, uh, do you want to spend, do I want to spend, you know, three to five years? on uh, a, a book. Do I want to turn a, an enjoyable pastime into work? Mm. <laughs> so you mentioned you're, you're not you're you're not under book contract. Yeah. Is it usually the case with you that you that you're given these assignments or do you usually come up with them and I am curious and then I uh, research I research something into the ground. Yes. So uh, last question on this n potential new project. Sure. Um, how do you get people to do these interviews? Like you solicit them on the web or? No, you just ask. Just so there are people that you know or people uh, that people that you know know? Yeah, kind of. It's not good to interview friends. Uh, and it's also weird. Mm -hmm. um, but mostly you just try to find people who fit that demographic and who are open. 
um, and who, you know, I, so I did one sample chapter, chapter that as I'm asking people, it's like, this is what I want to do because I'm not interested in taking your complete sexual history. What I want to mm -hmm. know is, again, the points when desire and uh, practice changed. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's a very slippery topic. So I'm, uh, you know, I'm in the middle of it. You got, you got me at the, the early stages. <laughs> Okay, so you said you were promoted, what, how did you put it, promoted up? I, I have failed upwards. Failed upwards. Yes. So um, tell us a little bit about your role as editor-in-chief. Sure. And um, th obviously it's nothing like the kinds of things we've been talking about so sure, far. Sure, sure, sure. So um, say something about that. And um, you, you, I, I'm having a little uh, difficulty understanding if this is a good thing for you. No, or no, it's amazing. It's yeah. a really great company and it's a great job uh, and w a wonderful staff that I have. Um, and my job is to sort of come in and, you know, we have great journalistic instincts and, again, very talented journalists, but um, I am coming in to uh, help with our digital first strategy, so getting things up quickly, getting the, disseminating them out on social media, uh, finding what works, what doesn't, um, you know, it, it's really sort of helping uh, push traditional news values but into the new century and finding what works in terms of um, uh, story content and how do we engage with our community and how do we keep our core mission and our sort of civic contract with our readers but also take into effect uh, take into account new readership because you know in many places uh, subscriptions has, have fallen but given the number of eyeballs we have on the web like mm -hmm. we have more readers than ever mm -hmm. so it's trying to figure out that equation uh, and it is an energizing um, really exciting time to be in journalism. It's really the the new frontier. I mean, everybody's trying to figure that out. Yeah. Right? The whole yeah, yeah. old newspaper world is trying to figure it out. How are you guys doing? Good, good, good. I mean, it, it, it's it's not easy, but I think you know we have a dedicated staff, curious people, um, and some really great ideas. So um, I love going to work every day. And how, how many of us can say that? So tell me, what's your prediction about the uh, the fate of journalism? in the 21st century? I mean, the fate of journalism is the fate of any other industry, and that is you have to innovate or you become ir irrelevant. So um, our fate is the same as everyone else, um, and it's just sort of being out on in front of that. I think uh, too often newspapers, because their margins were very high, it was a good business for a long time, they didn't feel the need to um, try new things and innovate and be on the cusp of new technologies. Um, and I think uh, some people are playing, paying catch, playing catch up, and um, others of us are trying to drive the train. Okay, well, thank you for that. I, it's been a really interesting conversation. We're out of time. Thanks for taking the time to speak with us today, and I'm going to try to drive this train. Um, we've been speaking with Robert K. Elder, editor in chief for Chicago Sun Times Media Local, and an alumnus of the School of Journalism and Communication. Elder presented a talk back after the screening of the classic film A Man for All Seasons at the Bijou Art Cinemas on October 17th, 2013, as a guest of the UO Cinema Studies Program and School of Journalism and Communication. Thank you for watching. Mm -hmm.